Hanukkah lasts for eight days. Why? Seven is the number of the natural world, but eight is the number of the supernatural. It's rising above. God doesn't want us to live from the place of the seven. He doesn't want us to live from the place of the natural. He wants us to live from the place of the supernatural. In terms of our understanding our faith and who Jesus was as this Jewish teacher, right, who himself observed Hanukkah, John chapter 10, right? He's at the temple during Hanukkah. We feel that it's it's just as Christian for us to do it because of the connection to our faith and who Jesus is. If it weren't for uh, this holiday and the defeat of, of the Greeks who, who wanted to destroy Judaism, uh, it might have ended the God idea for uh, literally only God knows how long. So its significance is monumental. What is Hanukkah? Well, it's not Jewish Christmas. Yes, both take place in winter. And yes, families may gather together, decorations may be hung, gifts may be given, and fatty foods may be consumed. But these two festivals have their own reason for the season. While Christmas celebrates the birth of Jesus, Hanukkah commemorates the rededication of the temple in Jerusalem. One story begins with a savior and hope of the world. The other begins with a priest and leader of a rebellion. His name was Mattathias. He was a Jewish elder living in Judea, modern day Israel, during the rule of Greek dictator Antiochus IV. Upon taking the throne to the Seleucid Empire, which was based in Syria, this mad king outlawed Judaism. In the years that followed, he became desperate to Hellenize his kingdom. So he ordered the invasion of Jerusalem in 168 BC. In the name of their king and the Greek god Zeus, Seleucid soldiers slaughtered thousands of Jews and desecrated their temple. It was then that Mattathias turned from priest to resistance commander. He led his five sons and a small band of Jewish fighters in a campaign for freedom against Antiochus and his brutal regime. Although Mattathias did not live to see the end of the war, his sons succeeded in their fight for justice. Three years after the massacre, the Jewish warriors toppled the invading empire and reclaimed their temple, earning the title Maccabee, which means hammer. This story has been handed down throughout the ages, but is it true? Well, according to archeological expert Danny the Digger Herman, evidence of the Maccabees and their miraculous revolution can be found today throughout the Israeli city of Modin. It just requires a little digging. The story of Hanukkah, this great story of a successful Jewish rebellion against foreign power, some 2,200 years ago, begins here. I am at ancient Modi'in, the hometown of the Maccabees. In the second century BC, the Jews were back in their ancestral land, but they were not independent. Antiochus III had a policy that the Jews have to pay their taxes, but they had religious freedom. However, his successor, Antiochus IV, led a complete opposite policy and banned Jewish religious practice. Now, forcing taxes upon a person is one thing, but forbidding you from your religious freedom, that is something the Jews were not willing to tolerate. And here, at the ancient city of Modi'in, this is where the successful Maccabean revolt began. The Jews in the second century BC were back in their ancestral land. They have managed to recover from the Babylonian exile and return to the land of Israel. But they were at first under Persian control, later under Ptolemaic control, and in the second century BC, they were under Seleucid Greek power. And Antiochus III had a contract with the Jews. They had to pay taxes, but they did have certain political rights, and especially important, they had religious freedom. It was his successor, Antiochus IV, 
who changed the policy and forbade Jews from convening on Shabbat, from circumcision, from keeping kosher. He wanted them to become pagan like he was. And when he defiled their temple in Jerusalem and tried forcing the people of Modin here to join this pagan worship, when his representative reached Modi'in, summoning all the elders and introducing this new cult, it was Matitya, the priest, who approached him in the altar and yet stabbed him to death and trashed the altar and called everyone around him. Anyone who is faithful to God's covenant, to our God's covenant, who follows our law, follow me, and ignited the Jewish rebellion. Now, let's put this into context. What are the odds of a few Jewish peasants, farmers, rebelling against a mighty Greek army? A well-trained military force equipped with weapons, with shields. They even had elephants. Matitya knew it's not gonna be an easy task. And he appoints his son Judah to be the military commander. And Judah the Maccabee, in retrospect, one of the greatest military tacticians, realizing that his people are maybe highly motivated but not well equipped, they hide in the hills and they attack the Greeks only when they are not prepared and in the most vulnerable locations. Judah attacks them where they must narrow their forces in this steep ascent and decimates them. But Antiochus is determined. This region is gonna remain under my power. Antiochus makes another attempt. And now he sends again a big force to attack Jerusalem, but reaching it from the south. Nevertheless, Judas is again prepared for that scenario. Again he attacks, and again he is victorious. And this time he uses the momentum and Judas reaches Jerusalem. He reaches the temple. He purifies it of the pagan worship that Antiochus has established there and finds the menorah with a small juglet with pure oil next to it. He ignites the light. The menorah is lit, but with a small amount. It should last for only one day or so, but by miracle, it kept lighting for eight consecutive days. And this is the source of the Jewish light festival that is celebrated to this day every year around Christmas, Hanukkah. Tracking the ancient site of Modi'in can be done by tracking one specific monument that is described in detail in the Book of Maccabees, the Tomb of the Maccabees. The Tomb of the Maccabees was built on a hilltop and was quite a remarkable building. It had seven pyramids over it. It had reliefs depicting weapons and ships. However, does this look like a building with seven pyramids? Does it look even like a, a tomb from the Hellenistic period? Today, scholarship agrees that while this is very impressive, it is not the tomb of the Maccabees. The location of the tomb of the Maccabees and the city of Modin is still somewhat of a mystery. It has to be in this area, but its exact location is still a matter of scholarly dispute. While the location of the tomb of the Maccabees is still somewhat of a mystery, very interesting archeological discoveries have been made in this area. This is the very southern edge of the modern city of Modin, which was developed about 20 years ago. I know so because I bought a house in this section and salvage excavations conducted in this part have uncovered some very interesting remains dating to the time of the Maccabees. They include agricultural installations like an olive press, a white mosaic floor, and at the very end, a stone structure of benches lined against the wall focused around the center. This is a synagogue. A synagogue that is dated to the time of King Herod, but beneath it lies another layer 
from the time of the Maccabees. And this makes it the oldest synagogue ever found in the Holy Land and one of the oldest in Jewish history in general. Realizing that this site could be attributed to the Maccabean themselves attracts Jews and visitors to this day. Some people come and even pray here at the very same place where the Maccabees may have dwelt, may have assembled at the same spot some 2,200 years ago. While people tend to think that archaeologists are all about big discoveries, like mosaic floors of wine presses or synagogues and temples and palaces, no, sometimes what gets us most excited are actually small little artifacts. Small little artifacts like weapons. This item is an arrowhead, a bronze arrowhead used in one of the battles in the Hellenistic period. And this is even more exciting. This is a American football-like shaped item. This thing is heavy, aerodynamic, and very deadly. This is a device used in the slingshots in the Hellenistic period, both by the Maccabees and the Seleucid Greeks. And finding it here, holding it in my hand 2,200 years after it was used in the battles is such an exhilarating moment for me. Yes, the Maccabees have battled here a long time ago, but their achievement and their spirit and their legacy is something that we cherish and follow to this day. Happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah is about miracles, the unbelievable defeat of a tyrannical regime, the incredible rescue of the Holy Temple, and the supernatural gift of light. The story goes that during the temple's reconsecration, the Maccabees discovered a single jar of pure oil. It was barely enough to light the grand menorah for one night. Yet inexplicably, the oil not only lasted through the night, but for eight whole days, feeding the eternal flame. The following year, the eight-day holiday was born, what the Gospel of John calls the Feast of Dedication. Now, more than 2,000 years later, some believe this feast has become more commercial and less spiritual. But for Zev Orenstein, Director of International Affairs at the City of David, Ancient Jerusalem, Hanukkah remains a testament to the Jewish faith and a hallmark of the Maccabees' legacy. What is so special about Hanukkah? What does the word Hanukkah even mean? Hanukkah means dedication. What is being dedicated? What we're celebrating on Hanukkah is the rededication of the temple. When the Greeks defiled the temple atop the Temple Mount, one of the first goals, once the rebellion against the Greeks begins, is to take back the temple, to take back the Temple Mount, to take back Jerusalem. Early on in the rebellion against the Greeks, Mattathias and his sons, together with those fighting alongside them, are able to take back the Temple Mount. But they're devastated once they enter inside because they see to what extent the Greeks had desecrated the Temple, had defiled the Temple and every part of it, including the Holy of Holies, including the altar. So they couldn't just restart the service. They understood that they would first have to repurify the entire temple complex. And that took time, but eventually they're able to cleanse the whole temple and they're ready to start the temple service once again. And one of the central pillars of the temple service is the daily lighting of the menorah. And there's a problem, because the only way you can light the menorah is with special olive oil 
made exclusively for that purpose. But what did the Greeks do? The Greeks, in part of their desecration of the temple, desecrated all of the oil that had been sealed and set aside for the lighting of the menorah. So when the Maccabees come in and want to restart the temple service, they want to light the menorah, they're stuck. They don't have any oil. Until one small flask of oil is discovered, still sealed, still kosher for use in the lighting of the menorah. But there's a problem, because this one flask will only last for one day. And it will take many days before new olive oil will be ready for use in the temple. And so the Maccabees, who themselves were priests, they had a dilemma. Should they light the menorah with that one flask of oil that they had, hoping, believing that some way things would work out? They decided to light anyway. And ultimately that oil, it kept burning. Not for one day, not for two days, not for three, not for four, five, six, or seven, but it kept burning for eight days. Now, what are some of the customs and traditions that people who practice the Hanukkah festival today, that they take part in? The central tradition that we have on Hanukkah is of course, to light the menorah or as we say in Hebrew, the Chanukiah, the Hanukkah lamp. Because one of the central elements of the festival is to publicize the miracle, to increase light. And that's why the families, when they're lighting these Chanukiot or menorahs, they're lighting them in the window or in the door frame, where people passing by will be able to see that light and to be uplifted by that light, by that miracle, as a reminder that in many ways today, we're all lamplighters. We're all striving to bring light into the world, to our own lives, to our families, to our communities, to our nations, and really to the whole world. One teaching in our faith is, a little bit of light drives away a lot of darkness. And Hanukkah comes in the middle of the winter, at perhaps the darkest time of the year where the sun sets really early. And at that moment, at perhaps the darkest time of the year, it's when we're bringing the most light into the world to remind ourselves and everyone else that no matter how dark it might be around us, there's always light that we can shine. Another custom that we have on the Hanukkah festival is related to the miracle of the oil. Well, Jewish tradition has come up with a few very clever ways, which is, in short, to eat foods that are saturated in oil. So one of the most common foods is donuts. We're talking about a unique type of donut called a sufganiyah that you find in Israel, fried in oil. Uh, and there are all sorts of different kinds with different flavors. And when you walk the streets of Jerusalem, uh, it's become a big business seeing all the different kinds of sufganiyot. But the reason why we're eating donuts on Hanukkah is not just because donuts are delicious, but it's meant to remind us of the miracle of the oil. And one of the things that we try to do in our faith is not just to remember intellectually, but what are the things we can do in our lives to, in some physical manifestation, bring that miracle to life. Now there's one other custom that has really entered the hearts of small children, and that is what is known as the small toy known as a dreidel a four-sided top, which has on each side a Hebrew letter. There are two different versions of this top. The four letters spell out the words, Nes Gadol Haya Po, a great miracle happened here in Jerusalem. Or if you're outside of Israel, it's Nes Gadol Haya Sham, a great miracle happened there, referring to, of course, the land of Israel, but the person being somewhere else. Now, what was the purpose of this small little top? And the answer is very simple. 
When the Greeks outlawed the study of Torah, that was something that the Jewish people would not abide. And so what would they do? They would study the Torah in hiding and they would have the kids sitting outside somewhere playing with this little top. And when the kids would see the Greek mercenaries coming, they would shout out, the Greeks are coming, the Greeks are coming. Still today, Jewish children play this game of dreidel. Depending on the letter that the top falls out on, uh, you either earn chocolate coins or you lose chocolate coins. And it's why ultimately, both for its heartwarming and, and stomach filling uh, customs, but also the message being so relevant and so uplifting that makes Hanukkah one of the most beloved festivals of our day today. The fact that for the last 2000 plus years, here in the land of Israel, here in Jerusalem, and throughout the world, where Jews have been celebrating this festival, lighting the menorah in their windows, in far-flung communities, in the most unexpected of places, shows that ultimately, the spirit of the Maccabees, the spirit of Hanukkah endured. The idea that when you stand true to your values, to your faith, to your way of life, that ultimately, when you stand with God, things will endure. That even though it may seem dark, the story of Hanukkah reminds us that there is light to be found. And that ultimately, we are the ones responsible for bringing that light into the world. Why celebrate Hanukkah if you're not Jewish? And why even bother learning the history or understanding the meaning behind this festive occasion if you and your loved ones don't follow Judaism? As Christians, we have our own spiritual anniversaries and sacred feasts, and many of us would probably agree that we're happy sticking to just one religious calendar. But the fact is Christianity has Semitic roots. Our Savior, Jesus, is Hebrew. The original 12 apostles were also Hebrew, and in the time of the New Testament, the earliest Christians were seen as a Jewish sect. For Fusion Global founder Rabbi Jason Sobel, Jewish holidays are biblical holidays, and Hanukkah is absolutely for Christians. He says it's not just a time for the Jewish people, it is a time for all people, because it is the Lord's appointed time. Rabbi Jason Sobel, always great to have you with us. Growing up, you observed Hanukkah, and then you became a follower of Yeshua, Jesus. Give us a comparison, the early days, what Hanukkah meant to you, and then how it took on a whole new meaning once you became a follower of Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Hanukkah growing up was one of my favorite holidays. For most Jewish kids, it's the Jewish version of Christmas in the sense you get gifts and you eat chocolate and you eat potato pancakes known as latkes, and it was always a great family time with uh, great memories of songs and lighting the menorah. But I think as a follower of Yeshua, realizing that every major event in the life of Yeshua, Jesus, happened on a Jewish holiday, they all find their fulfillment in him, they all point to him, that he celebrated them, that he celebrated in John chapter 10, he actually goes up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Dedication, and that's Hanukkah. And so when I understood the things he said, like I am the light of the world, in the context of Hanukkah, it just made it come to life in just such a deeper and more meaningful way. Yeah, anything Jesus observed, we should take very <laughs> seriously, Rabbi. And Look, uh, Christians watching right now, many Christians saying, why does Hanukkah matter to me? Why would you say that Hanukkah matters not just to the Jewish people, but to every follower of Yeshua? Yeah, I think on several levels. I think number one is Hanukkah really celebrates two, two things. It celebrates fighting and lighting. Huh. The Jewish people were under the tyranny of this evil king by the name of Antiochus or Antiochus is another way to pronounce it. Yeah and they were having their religious liberties stripped of them. And I think we see that going on in the world today, and we need to stand up for freedom. We need to stand up for our faith, not in a militant way, but in a way that honors Yeshua as the Messiah. 
So I think that's really important as well because in that day of Yeshua, really part of what the fighting was about is that this evil king was trying to outlaw the biblical practices, God's commandments. He was trying to get the people to worship foreign gods. So there was so much idolatry, so much immorality. And I think we see that going on in our culture. It was really a culture war, what was going on. And we're in the midst of that today. And we need to stand up for the truth. But the other is about lighting. They went into the house of God. They rededicated the temple, which had been desecrated. They had to light these seven branch menorah so they could do the sacrifices and ministry in it because God says the seven branch candelabra has to be lit continually. They only had enough oil to last for one day. They lit in faith and God did a miracle. The oil lasts for seven additional days, so a total of eight days. And that's why Hanukkah is the festival of all of lights and it lasts eight days. Yeah. And I think it's important because the verse for Hanukkah from the prophets is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so that's significant because Hanukkah lasts for eight days. Why? Seven is the number of the natural world, but eight is the number of the supernatural. It's rising above. God doesn't want us to live from the place of the seven. He doesn't want us to live from the place of the natural. He wants us to live from the place of the supernatural. Jesus rose from the dead on the eighth day, for example. He dies on the sixth day, Friday in the tomb on the seventh day, rises on the eighth day. You turn eight on its side, it's a number of infinity. It's the infinite and eternal breaking into the finite. It's supernatural presence and power of God released in our lives to do the miraculous by the power of God's spirit. Wow, so there's much deeper meaning to Hanukkah than I think many people realize. As you said, Rabbi, Look, eight days, we get gifts, kind of the Jewish version of Christmas. That's how I saw it growing <laughs> yeah, up too. Yeah, As a Gentile, yeah. I said, wow, okay, this is your version of Christmas. But the Maccabees, those warriors for religious freedom, such a great point. We're in those days today in terms of our religious freedom being infringed upon, including right here in the United States. So I think the Maccabees are an inspiration today now more than ever. Okay, how do you and your family now observe Hanukkah. Now that you know the Lord, you know him in a personal way, and Hanukkah has such great meaning, you know the biblical meaning of it, how do you personally celebrate Hanukkah now today with your family? Yeah, I think one important thing just to remember is that the when we light the menorah, so every night we will light what is known as the menorah or Hanukkah, okay, and every night you add one candle to it over eight nights. So you go from one on the first night to eight on the last night. But what's so amazing, it was in the context of Hanukkah that Yeshua said, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. You know, one of the things that's really important to understand is that Hebrew is alphanumeric. That means that you write numbers with letters because there's no Roman numerals in the Bible. That means every Hebrew word has a numerical value. And that's so important because when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, that has a numerical value of 358. Why is that significant? Because 358 is also the numerical value of the phrase in Hebrew, Mashiach, Messiah. So Messiah 358 was to be the light of the world 358. And he literally calls us to be that light in the midst of the darkness in the world in which we live. And so we light the menorah to publicize the miracle, remember who Yeshua is, remember what he calls us to do, which is to be a light. We spin the dreidel, which is the four-sided top, to remind us of the miracle that God did. We sing songs, we eat potato latkes or pancakes, but all of it points to Messiah in one way or another. Rabbi Jason Sobel, thank you so much for breaking that down for us. You're making me hungry too. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah, my friend. Happy Hanukkah, Hag Sameach. As we step into this Hanukkah season amidst the turmoil in Israel, it's clear that this Hanukkah stands apart from any other in Israel's modern history. Dr. Jeffrey Seif is here to take us on a journey back to the earliest days of the Jewish state and what the striking parallels are between the events of that pivotal time and the current challenges Israel is facing. Dr. Seif, great to have you with us. 1948, 
obviously monumental and perilous time in the modern state of Israel. What are the parallels between that time and today, especially as Hanukkah is upon us? Well, hey, Eric, glad to be with you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Jews have always had a challenging time making their way from the womb to the tomb. It's yeah. been tough politically with Israel's reemergence, miraculous as that is. Uh, that story's played out against the backdrop of nation states roundabout forever wanting to snuff out that light. And uh, there is a, uh, a famous Hebrew expression that goes along with Hanukkah, Neshkadol HaYashem, a great miracle happened there, harking to the Hanukkah story. And uh, Jews look at uh, Israel as a modern miracle, to be sure, and the nation's emergence against all odds uh, certainly parallels the Hanukkah story for uh, back in the day of Hanukkah, uh, the Syrians, particularly under Antiochus Epiphanes, were bent on destroying the Jews. But God uh, brought against, uh, brought about a great miracle against the Assyrians, the Assyrians there. And, you know, we're still fighting them. Yeah, it still goes on today from, from over 2,000 years ago, Dr. Seif, to 1948, 67, 73, 2023. Unfortunately, it goes on, but you've done a great job in teaching the Jewish roots of the Christian faith. And why now more than ever, with everything unfolding, prophetic events unfolding in Israel, why now more than ever is it important for Christians, for followers of Jesus, Gentile followers of Jesus, to get plugged in to what's happening in God's land, including what are previously seen by many as strictly Jewish holidays like Hanukkah? Well, great question. And among other things, I serve as the executive director of the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations. And we live in the world of the Jesus story on the one hand and the Jewish story on the other. And, and our communities keep their feet in both worlds. And people that appreciate that, Jewish and non-Jewish alike, kind of make their way to these Messianic synagogues. But even those that don't, I think there's value in understanding the Jewish roots of the Jesus story because it gets you in touch with Jesus. It gets you in touch with Bible prophecy. Uh, individuals look at the Jesus story through a Catholic lens, through a Protestant lens. I'm glad anybody looks from any perspective, yeah. but when you add a Jewish lens to it, you get brand new use on the good news. It, it, it brings it alive in technicolor. Yeah, during the Hanukkah season, Dr. Seif, how can believers around the world support the Jewish people as Israel, look, is in an existential struggle against evil forces, as you mentioned, that seek its destruction? What can Christians do around the world, again, especially during Hanukkah, to really stand with Israel and the Jewish people like never before as we see anti-Semitism reaching record levels? Well, great question. And prayer uh, is, is always good. I think first to appreciate the value in standing with the Jewish people. I think praying for the Jewish state. And quite frankly, and I'm pleased to see it, and I'd love to see more of it. You know, Hanukkah time is Christmas time and people give gifts. Why not uh, give a gift uh, to uh, the, the people of Israel? A financial gift to help because the, the needs there are great. I know in the union of Messianic Jewish congregations, uh, we've raised more money in the last few weeks than we have ever before. But it, it comes in, we send it right out to and through Messianic works in Israel. Why not bless the Jewish state at a time when so many are cursing her? Yeah, and in the process, you just mentioned it, Dr. Seif, in the process, fulfill that biblical mandate laid out in Genesis 12, 3, to bless Israel and the Jewish people. Yes. Hey, last question. We're talking Hanukkah. Give us a personal take on what Hanukkah has meant to you and your family and how you observe this holiday. My earliest memories go back to the uh, the holiday of Hanukkah and there's others as well, but Hanukkah particularly because it's so much fun. All the Jewish holidays, by the way, are for the children. And so much centers around, people tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. I mean, <laughs> Hanukkah, the Syrians tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. Passover, the Egyptians tried to kill us, we won, let's, let's eat. Uh, the Feast of Purim, the Book of Esther, you know, the Persians tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, it's, Hanukkah is a fascinating time. It brings back warmer days when my parents were alive, may they rest in peace, when the family was together, when there's some warmth in an otherwise very cold world.
Yeah, and amazing, you know, all those forces you mentioned, the Egyptians, the Syrians, Haman and the mighty Persian Empire, they're all in the ash heap of history, but the nation of Israel and the Jewish people continue against all odds to not only survive, but to thrive. Right, and there's a saying in Hebrew, Am Yisroel Chai, the people of Israel live. Come on, devil, bring it on. You're gonna lose at the end of the day. <laughs> We're still around. Like you said, those people are in the ash heap of history. Amen. Dr. Jeffrey Seif, thank you so much. Happy Hanukkah. God bless. We'll see you again soon. With understanding comes blessing. By realizing the heritage of our faith, we are blessed with a revelation of who we are in Christ. And by honoring the milestones of our biblical lineage, we are blessed with a wisdom and appreciation of the power and grace of God. That's exactly what happened to pastor, composer, author, and teacher, Dumasani Washington. And we are joined now by my good friend, Pastor Dumasani Washington. Dumasani is the founder and CEO of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. Pastor Dumasani, it is great to see you once again, my friend. My friend, and, great to be with you. Yeah, knowing you as long as I've known you, I know that you and your family do Shabbat together. And when Hanukkah rolls around, you celebrate Hanukkah with the Jewish community. First off, why would a Christian pastor be so interested in celebrating Hanukkah, which many see as a strictly Jewish holiday? Eric, so my wife and I, 30 years plus now, we've been on this, this journey of really embracing the Jewish roots of our faith. And so the Hanukkah celebration with our family, which is part of that, right? Like you said, observing Shabbat, those types of things. And, having friends throughout the Jewish community, both religious and non-religious, and it's just been a blessing, right? And it has even shed more and more light on our faith as Christians, right? And what's interesting to us and to me about the Hanukkah celebration is that, as you know, it falls in that, what, what we as Christians call the intertestamental period, right? Between Malachi, between uh, Matthew, but here's this hugely important event that Daniel prophesied about in which the Maccabees defend the Jewish people and they're successful. In terms of our understanding our faith and who Jesus was as this Jewish teacher, right? Who himself observed Hanukkah, John chapter 10, right? He's at the temple during Hanukkah. We feel that it's, it's just as Christian for us to do it because of the connection to our faith and who Jesus is. Yeah. Now you had a fascinating journey in the early 1990s where you really discovered the Jewish roots mm -hmm of your Christian faith. Tell us more about that. Well, it was quite accidental. Even though I, I was always intrigued by the Jewish roots, I kind of got more involved in it. Uh, my wife and I are from California. In the 90s, we moved to Virginia and I became the minister of music at a church there in the, in the Fairfax County area. And there was a Messianic synagogue in the next county that needed a keyboard player. They had music and their keyboard player was actually moving to Israel. And so they asked uh, me that that rabbi knew our pastor and he asked me to come and play. Um, Eric, as I tell people all the time, it wasn't a spiritual decision for me. I was a <laughs> young husband, two kids, need to put right. more food on the tables. I go on, okay, here's a Saturday gig I can do, right? Yeah. So I went, but God completely had a different plan in mind, right? So I went there and I'm listening to the Torah readings and everything and God just touched my heart. And that kind of one thing led to the, to the next. And that's why back in the 90s, that's where that journey started for us. Yeah, and your journey has continued with your work at the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You talk a lot of, with your work at IBSI, that's the acronym for it, yes, about the parallels between the struggles and the journey of the Jewish people mm -hmm. and the African American community, yes, and that struggle for freedom, which is obviously first and foremost yes, with the story of the Maccabees at Hanukkah. Yes, Dumasani, unpack that a bit more for us. The parallels between the Jewish people, their struggle for freedom, yes, and African Americans. It's interesting that among other things, when you're talking about African American history, although it can, it's, it's broad, but there are some, some markers that are there. And when we're starting as a musician, as I am, when you're starting with things like what we call the Negro spirituals, go down Moses, let my people go, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, these songs that are now centuries old were sung by Africans enslaved on plantations and the hope for freedom was tied into the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? They were singing about songs of freedom and those songs were about the Hebrews in Egypt, right? That was the beginning of it in terms of the United States, in terms of history. But what you had throughout there was this synergy. Oftentimes, 
people who are aware, they'll talk about the synergy between Dr. King and Joshua Heschel during the, the, the civil rights movement, right? You have the Jewish community overrepresented in the African-American struggle for civil rights. But a generation before that was the Jewish philanthropist uh, Julius Rosenwald of Sears Roebuck fame and Booker T. Washington, the educator, they come together and build Rosenwald schools all over the segregated South, right? So this synergy and this connection goes back centuries, right? And it goes back in terms of, often Eric and our organization, we say that the first Africa-Israel summit was when the Queen of Sheba traveled 3,000 years ago to Jerusalem to meet with Solomon, right? So those ties are deep and that's part of what we, uh, what we talk about when we talk about what that heritage actually is, that connection. Yeah, unpack that a bit more to do myself. Yes. Because look, you're traveling and speaking to African American communities, and you're actually traveling to Africa yes, to educate them about Israel and the Jewish people and that important historical and biblical link. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So, our organization has launched last year what's called the Peace Initiative, and that's an acronym for Plan for Education, Advocacy, and Community Engagement. We recruit young African American men and women. We take them on a nine month journey of study and preparation. We learn about the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Africa-Israel relationship, all these things that we're talking about now. And we take two overseas trips. We say December is the motherland, June is the holy land, right? right? December, we went to South Africa. And we unpack why that whole Israel apartheid lie is such a visceral lie, Eric. I mean, we go to Robben Island. We actually learn what the actual apartheid struggle was and why it's so heinous to connect it to the free and democratic state of Israel, right? But then in the spring, we went to the holy land, right? And so our connection there, as we're telling African-Americans, and we will be doing this with young Africans as well, we're talking about both the ancient and the modern day connection where there's Africa-Israel, the black and Jewish synergy. And Eric, really, and I really want people to understand this, we say this all the time, that we know that in the body, there's no black or white, there's no Jew, Gentile, the word of God says, right? There's, there's, there's no separation, right? So we in no way focus on that in some sort of negative thing. We do that in large part because as you know, the slanders against Israel, apartheid state, Zionism is racism. Now all those things not true, but they actually are pilfering from those struggles, whether it's black South Africans, African-Americans, and we know that we have to set the record straight. Hey, speaking of those slanders against Israel and the Jewish people right now, obviously, Israel is at war mm -hmm. uh, with demonic forces, Hamas, the Iranian regime, Hezbollah, and others. Mm -hmm. And much of the world, it seems, Dumasani is, even though Israel was attacked, mm -hmm. is against Israel mm -hmm. and taking the side of Hamas. Mm -hmm. Why right now, at this moment in time, is Hanukkah, the Hanukkah story and message, mm -hmm. more important than ever before? That central theme of the Hanukkah message, as you know, Eric, was the Jewish people being attacked for being Jews, right? Yeah. Antiochus says, no more Torah observance, no more Shabbat observance, all of these things. And they fought to the death to remain faithful to what God had called them to do. Yeah. Look at what's happening now. Here Hamas is, as you and I both know, this is not about settlements. It's not about any of those types of things. Hamas's charter says, destroy the Jews, destroy the Jewish state, which is what Antiochus tried to do the same thing. So our Jewish brothers and sisters know they've seen this for millennia. They know that there are people who just want to wipe them out. This is not about negotiations and none of those types of things. It's about destroying the Jewish state. So Hanukkah now, I would encourage Christians now that if they haven't, and I know you've been teaching on this for a while, Eric, find out about what this holiday is and why it's so important for us as Christians to understand, but why it's so important also for our Jewish brothers and sisters. And they'll see even more so as, the, as it says in every generation, there have been those who rise up against us, as our Jewish brothers and sisters say, but the Holy One, blessed be He, He has sustained us. Hanukkah reminds us of that very, very powerfully. And Israel will prevail once again. Absolutely. Pastor Dumasani Washington, always great to see you, my friend. You, my friend. God bless, keep up the great work. Happy Hanukkah and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too, my friend. Thanks, Dumasani. Thank you, sir. It was an uprising doomed to fail, a temple beyond recovery, a fire that would not survive the night, but somehow the oppressed won freedom, the holy house was restored, and the eternal flame never dimmed. The miracles of Hanukkah have inspired generations throughout history and across the globe, from the patriots of the American Revolution, whose very battle cry, give me liberty or give me death, is said to have been cited from the Maccabee army. Columnist, radio talk show host, and public speaker Dennis Prager says this Hebrew holiday has forever impacted the lives of Americans, especially Christians. And we are joined now by nationally syndicated talk radio host and the founder of Prager University, the one and only Dennis Prager joins us. Dennis, happy Hanukkah. It is great to see you. I'm very happy to be with you. And I can say happy Hanukkah to you too, because 
the meaning of the holiday is entirely universal. So there's no reason in the world not to wish a non-Jew happy Hanukkah. Yeah, this is exciting. And by the way, I'm a fan. I just want to say for the record, I am adamant about Americans saying Merry Christmas and not Happy Holiday. Yes. Just want to make that clear. Oh, we love to hear the that. idea that because be, the idea that because I am not Christian, you should not say Merry Christmas to me is pure destructive narcissism. Mm. <laughs> it's my it's a national holiday. It is my country's holiday. Why would I not want to say Merry Christmas. That's right. You know, we're going to talk about religious freedom, the infringement upon religious liberties, and how that kind of ties into the Hanukkah story, Dennis, and the story of the Maccabees. Hey, a holiday in Hanukkah that is not in the Torah or the Tanakh, uh, but this has become probably to Americans at least the most well-known uh, Jewish holiday. Uh, why is Hanukkah to you uh, as an observant Jew why is Hanukkah and the story of the Maccabees so important, in particular today? Uh, again, it, it's, it's, its significance is obviously to Jews, uh, but it is universal. If it weren't for what happened on Hanukkah in about 167 BC, let's say, if, it, if that didn't happen, the, uh, the monotheistic idea would probably not have survived. At stake was the destruction of Judaism, the one religion at the time that affirmed the God of the Bible. There was no Christianity at the time, obviously. And so if it weren't for uh, this holiday and the defeat of, of the Greeks who, who wanted to destroy Judaism, uh, it might have ended the God idea for literally only God knows how long. So its significance is monumental. Yeah, and the oppressive measures uh, taken by the Seleucid Empire. Oh, yes. I mean, people, people might not realize uh, the temple, the holy temple was completely desecrated. And Dennis, as you said, the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was actually banned. Unbelievable. Oh, entirely. The, the interesting thing is, this was not Jew hatred, it was really Judaism hatred that animated uh, the Greeks there. Uh, so, you know, whether the Jews survived or not didn't bother them, but it bothered them that this belief in this one God uh, over everybody, one God who judges everybody, many scholars, and I've written a, a well-received book on anti-Semitism called Why the Jews. It's in its third or fourth edition. And we note how many non-Jewish scholars have pointed out that the Jews got hated for bringing a universal judging God into the world. This bugged a lot of people. And it still does today, by the way. Still does today. <laughs> That's exactly. And this story is so relevant today. I think the average American, and it's why we're doing this show, Dennis, even perhaps the average American Jew may not know the story uh, behind Hanukkah, yet the founding fathers of this nation, the United States of America, were profoundly impacted and influenced by the story of the Maccabees, their struggle for freedom and the struggle against tyranny. If all American Jews appreciated the Bible, especially the Hebrew Bible, and Judaism, as much as the founding fathers, Jewish life would be in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, an interesting well, element, Dennis, of the Hanukkah story and the Maccabees struggle is we had what were called the Hellenizers. There were aspects of Jewish society at the time who wanted to kind of go along to get along uh, with the Greeks and abandoned essentially their Judaism, uh, their Jewishness. So the Maccabees were really fighting to preserve a whole way of life, as you laid out. Today, we have obviously some serious infringements on religious freedom. We have a rise in anti-Semitism, a rise in Christian persecution around the world. Do you see what's unfolding right now globally and look at the story of the Maccabees as even more relevant today for the times we're living in? Anybody fighting for the Judeo-Christian bases of the United States is, in effect, a Maccabee. That, that's, that's correct. There, there is a Hellenization taking place 
both among Jews and Christians. I mean, you know, a vast number of, of both, but obviously there are so many more Christians in America, have basically abandoned Judeo-Christian values and accepted our version of Hellenic or Hellenized values, and that is the New York Times and, and the university. That, that's our Hellenizers of today. And again, vast numbers of Jews and Christians have left Judaism and Christianity uh, for what they're taught at college, which is the opposite of Judaism and Christianity. Yeah. And yet our society derives from the values of Jerusalem, from the values of the Bible, That's the right. Ten Commandments that you have written and spoken about so eloquently, eloquently Dennis, uh, for years, uh, to the point where there was actually a statue of Judah the Hammer, Judah Maccabee, at West Point. How important is it? For I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. It is fascinating. Is it still there? It is still there, I believe. It is still there. Judah the Hammer, one of the heroes of the Maccabee Revolt at West Point, because he's also, it makes sense to be at West Point, a military genius, really, a master tactician. That's a whole other story and element to the Maccabee story. Right, because, right. Well, well the Greeks so outnumbered the Jews that uh, it, it, he had to have been brilliant. That's correct. Yeah. I did not know that. You blew, you've blown my mind. I, I, <laughs> that, it, it so reinforces my belief that this country was founded truly by Judeo-Christians. Yeah. That's what they were. They were Judeo-Christians. They so appreciated the Jewish origins of, of the Bible, of the Christianity, of America. And, and, and of course, they were Christian. It's, it's painful. It's painful to see what has happened. Which, as I said earlier, the opposite is taught today. Uh, Dennis, last question. You mentioned right. the overwhelming odds that the Maccabees faced against the Greeks. Uh, the menorah uh, burning for eight days straight. A, a holiday, a festival of miracles here against improbable odds. As you've outlined, we're up against some pretty long odds, it seems, right now. But the story of the Maccabees seems to show us that even in the, in the darkest hour, there's always hope. What are your thoughts on that as we celebrate this Hanukkah? Well, yeah, this is the perfect analogy. If enough Americans take up the Maccabee cause, as it were, to fight against the Hellenizers, the the the. the the anti-Judeo-Christian forces, if, if people understand liberalism is not anti-Judeo-Christian values, but leftism is, and unfortunately liberals vote for the left, but that's a separate issue. We need more Jews and Christians to awaken to the threat. And let me just say as a Jew, the, the deepest hatred in this country right now is to Christians. I mean, that, that's not, not to Jews. There's a lot of anti-Semitism. It's rising because of the left uh, and, and because of some Islamic forces in the United States. Uh, but the, 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 the detestation of Christianity is just mind-boggling. And, and, of course, I warn people, and, I, and this is a perfect uh, uh, note to end on if you want to end, and, and that is... When Christianity died in Europe, what did we get? Fascism, communism, and Nazism. What will happen when Christianity dies in America? Every thoughtful person needs to answer that question. Yeah, which makes the message of Hanukkah even more resonant, a message of That's uh, right. rededication, Be a revival. Be a Maccabee. Well, Be a Maccabee. Dennis Prager, you are a Maccabee, my friend. Hey, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, and God Thank bless you. you. Thanks right. so much for joining us, as always. On the first night of Hanukkah, Jewish believers pray, praised are you, our God, ruler of the universe, who performed wondrous deeds for our ancestors in those ancient days, who has given us life, and sustained us and enabled us to reach this season. As Christians, we claim Jesus as the Messiah, but God, our Father, is the God of the New Testament and the Old. Within the chapters of both Hebrew and Christian scriptures, we read of his marvels. We see him rescuing, sustaining, and resurrecting Jews and Gentiles. We share the same ancestry, the same author. Our histories are interwoven eternally stitched to the great I am. Why does Hanukkah matter? 
It's a biblical holiday, an opportunity to understand and appreciate the historic divine intervention of God and a timeless universal reminder of the human longing for freedom, which is a gift from God above. So happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, and God bless. Hey, I'm Mati Shoshani, and thank you for watching the TBN Israel YouTube channel. We hope this video gave you greater understanding of Israel and her people. If you haven't already, subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. We'd love to hear from you, so be sure to share what you've learned and ask your questions and comments below. And invite your friends to join the conversation.